Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. I'm Chad, along with my co-host, Kelly. Kelly, how are you? I am good, Chad. How are you today? Good. Everything's good. I'm excited today. So we've got, today, everybody, we've got an issue that needs your help. Um, we're going to talk about protecting horses from this very strange piece of cruelty that you might not even have heard of before. Um, it's called soaring, S-O-R-I-N-G. Um, but before we even start, you're going to want this website by the end of this podcast. So I want to give you this website now so you can get it queued up, get ready to raise your hand and get your voice in there to help protect animals, uh, to protect, the, protect these horses, excuse me. So the website is humanesociety.org slash soaring, S-O-R-I-N-G, um, humanesociety.org slash soaring. And with that, um, so anyway, go to that site, raise your hand, help protect these uh, these horses and make your opinion heard. It's a big issue for us. And with that, let's get to our special guest today. Our special guest is the Senior Director of Equine Protection at the Humane Society of the United States, Keith Dane. Keith, welcome. Thank you. Hey, Chad. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Having me. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Well, this is so I, I I know we've we've talked a lot about soaring as an organization. I'm just trying to pretend like maybe people haven't heard of this thing because it's kind of a fringy kind of I've mentioned this to people recently and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So trying to start from the beginning. Can you, Keith, maybe give us a real quick maybe explanation of what this thing is? What is horse soaring? Very glad to. So soaring is a practice that's inflicted on a couple of breeds in the horse world, gated horses, specifically Tennessee walking horses, racking horses, and spotted saddle horses. And the whole point of it is to make the horses step higher for a show ring gate that we call the big lick um, through the use of pain inducing um, practices, um, things like putting caustic chemicals around the ankles of the horse's legs, causing great pain. These are things like kerosene or diesel fuel or oil of mustard that burn. And then when they ride the horses, they'll put these heavy chains or heavy aluminum rollers on the horse's ankles that strike against that sensitized tissue, causing even more pain and forcing the horse to lift their legs higher. Another method of soaring is what we call pressure shoeing, which is sort of a mechanical way of hurting the hoof of the horse, the bottom surface of the hoof, the sole. Again, the whole goal is to create pain in the horse's lower limbs, either their ankles and or their soles, so that they're constantly stepping higher for the show ring. Well, and I think, Chad, you mentioned how we, as an organization, you know, we kind of have heard of these terms, we're used to this, but what I found, and in, in Keith, I know in your work, this must be true, that even if people don't know what soaring is or haven't heard that, they absolutely think this is cruel once they hear about it. And so I, I want to go back to what you said, Chad, that there is action we're going to talk about today. So listeners, stay with us because uh, this is going to be an action podcast with some things for you to do. Um, Keith, I want to talk a little bit about you. You shared what soaring is. So what region, what part of the country is this happening? Uh, where is this taking place where this painful kind of these chemicals are put on the horses' hooves and their soles to do this, you know, to do a certain walk? So it used to be more widespread around the country. Thankfully, over the decades, um, it's sort of shrunk in terms of the geographic area, but it's still pretty, pretty prevalent in the deep south. So think of Tennessee as being sort of the hotbed or the epicenter, and all of the states around Tennessee that Tennessee touches, there is some degree of soaring going on. And then a few other pockets in Texas and Florida, but it's mostly Tennessee and all the states geographically surrounding it. And I just want to point out that the rest of the horse industry and the horse world agrees with us that this is cruelty. It's really the only uh, intentional infliction of cruelty on any species, any breed, or any uh, discipline of horse that's done specifically to create pain for performance. You know, there may be other practices that are unintentionally cruel or create pain, but this is intentional cruelty, intentional pain, just to win a blue ribbon. And it, again, is very focused uh, in the deep south. And you said Tennessee, Keith, and I I really don't like to throw shade to Tennessee because, uh, listeners, I was born there. Uh, so it is my birth state, but they do hold, I think, an annual event there, right? Keith, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the biggest national championship show for this breed is in Tennessee, in Shelbyville. It's called the Tennessee Walking Horse National Celebration. It's been going on for, you know, over 80 years. 
Um, and it was held just at the end of August, beginning of September. I and one of our colleagues in our equine protection department attended the show this year to monitor the condition of the horse, to observe you know, how many people are showing up for this, um, et cetera, and how the horses are being inspected. And we're happy to say that you know the, the crowds which used to fill the, the grandstand to the rafters, which holds like 30,000 people, uh, was just a fraction of the way full. Um, and it has been the case for the last several years. So the crowds are just continuing to sort of wane. The number of horses that are being exhibited continues to go down. Um, and we you know, we've made great progress on this issue over the past 15 or 20 years since I first joined HSUS and uh, insisted or uh, persuaded the organization that this become one of our major equine campaigns. Um, so the number of horses being shown the number of people coming, et cetera, has been going down because we've been educating the public about the cruelty that goes on behind this practice and behind this, this spectacle, if you will. And uh, people are turning away from it. That's great. That's fantastic. So can you remind us how many, how many horses about does this, uh, does it affect every year? Still about 10,000. We, we estimate yeah, in those three breeds. These are either horses that are just really young horses that haven't been shown yet, but they're being tormented at a very early age. You know, they typically start these horses under saddle and through the, the soaring process anywhere from 12 to 15 to 18 months of age. So less than two years old. Um, so those horses haven't been shown yet, but they're being subjected to this. And then they're the ones that are being shown in those three breeds. So we estimate about 10,000 per year. And that wow. celebration, Keith, you were talking about, it was called a celebration in Tennessee. Is it a competition? Are there winners? Who are these winners? I mean, who who are we talking about? Yeah, it's like the big national championship. Sort of think about the Super Bowl or the World Series for the walking horse world. And uh, I think about 1,800 horses uh, were wow. participating. Not all of them were sore because some of them are shown naturally with just a regular keg shoe, a, a lightweight horseshoe. But most of them were probably sore at one time, if not very recently. And um, again, that number has been going down over the years, but uh, the celebration is their national championship. So the one, uh, the person who won the, the big championship, the world grand championship, as they call it, the trainer and rider of the horse is a man named John Allen Calloway, who has been under federal disqualification for violations of the Horse Protection Act, which is the federal law that was supposed to end soaring, passed back in 1970. He's been on by violation and disqualification a number of times, wow. yet he has won four world grand championships uh, in his career. That's crazy. So it's really, yeah. I mean, it's really indicative of the fact that if you're going to be competitive and win in these, you have to be violating the law and abusing horses. And well, that's the they... lesson. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Kelly. That's the lesson, yeah. right? That that uh, if they're giving this guy the the first place ribbon or whatever, and people know that he's violated rules before, but yet he continues to win, that seems crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there have been many examples of that over the recent years where somebody has won the World Grand Championship. In fact, Callaway's brother was one of the the individuals in this situation. Won the championship, and then the next week he went on a federal disqualification for eight months or a year. So, I mean, and they all know the trainers, the judges, the show all know that these guys are doing this and that they've well, been found they in copy? violation. So, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is the agency that is supposed to oversee uh, enforcement of the Horse Protection Act, again, passed in 1970. So, we're talking about over 50 years or a half a century where this law that was supposed to end soaring has failed to do so. Um, the USDA is the agency charged with enforcement. They send inspectors to about 20% of the shows in this world, this section of the horse world. Um, and the rest of the time, it's industry inspectors, mm -hmm. which are paid by the shows, which are often participants in the horse show industry themselves. And so it's sort of like the fox watching the hen house. These, uh, inspectors turn a blind eye often to these horses uh, when they're inspecting them. But they're supposed to be checked. Every horse is supposed to be checked before they go in the show ring at every show. And when USDA shows up, the violation rate, in other words, the number of horses that are found in violation of the law goes way up. So you know that when they're not there, the uh, industry inspectors are just, as I said, turning a blind eye to it. So how they're caught and how they're punished is when USDA does show up and they find a violation they can prosecute under the Federal Horse Protection Act. Quite often they will 
wait for there to be multiple violations per individual to make sure that they've got a solid case, and then they will prosecute and uh, they go before an administrative law judge, which is under the USDA, and um, and then they're either found in violation or they uh, sort of cop to a plea, if you will, and accept a, a disqualification in lieu of um, further prosecution. So they are they admitting guilt in that situation? They don't admit guilt. They basically just say, I'm willing to take the rap, um, but I'm not going to admit guilt. But if if you're a professional trainer and it's your livelihood, you're not going to accept an eight-month disqualification from showing unless you're guilty. Or, I mean, why would you? Of course. Yeah. Wow. This is really uh, eye-opening. You're saying the fox watching the hen house. This is really, you're, I'm showing this horse and the person judging where if I broke any rules could be a friend of mine or somebody that I work with or a cousin even. It could be a fellow trainer, uh, a fellow owner, a fellow breeder. Most likely the inspector knows the person that they're respecting the horse of. So, wow. So in the industry, it seems like there's not in, in some of these cases incentive to stop, but there are laws around this. And you've talked about the horse protection act. I mean, do these laws need strengthened or there loopholes or what, how do we get at this? Absolutely. I mean, the law has been uh, ineffective at ending soaring because of the loopholes that are in it. And uh, one mechanism for closing those loopholes is to amend USDA's regulations. There is the Horse Protection Act. And then under that, each agency, in this case, the USDA, has regulations that sort of fine tune how the law is going to be enforced. And some of the things that need to be fixed, the USDA can do on its own. One of those is to get rid of the industry self-inspection program, the, the fox watching the hen house scheme, which has been proven to be ineffective. In fact, USDA's own inspector general back in 2010 issued an audit report that said this scheme was a failure and needed to be abolished. So here we are 13 years ago and it's still around. US, USDA has proposed to amend it and amend the regulations and do away with it in the past, but they have not yet done it. However, right now, and this is where listeners can help us by taking action. USDA has proposed a regulatory change, which would in, in part eliminate the industry self-inspection scheme and replace it with a system of third-party independent inspectors who are either veterinarians or vet techs um, that USDA would oversee and license and have complete oversight over. So um, you know, we think that's going to be a, a big key to ending soaring is having uh, inspectors in the show you know, at the shows that are really doing a good job of weeding out the the violators. The other thing is that the equipment that's currently allowed on these horses at these shows is part of the soaring process. If you go to our website, you can search for information about what is soaring. The chains that are allowed currently in the show ring are part of the soaring process because they are used to train the horses to step higher. They also step these horses up on these tall platform shoes or what we call stacks, which can be anywhere from like three or four or five inches tall. And they nail these to the horse's hooves. You can see pictures of this on our website. To jack the horse's front end up, which shifts their balance, their weight to the back end, but also creates pain in the front legs because these are heavy objects. They're striking the ground with these heavy uh, platform shoes, and that causes pain in the hoof and the lower limbs. So the stacks need to go. Um, we believe every horse should be shown just with a regular horseshoe, like just about every other breed or discipline in the horse world, and get rid of these tall platform shoes that really are deforming to the horses. So if they get rid of the stacks and the heavy shoes and the chains and the industry conflicted uh, inspection program, um, that's going to go a long way toward ending soaring. And USDA published this proposed rule uh, back in August. There's a 60-day comment period, which ends October 20th. So we've got some time for folks to take action. And we're looking to get just as many public comments submitted uh, as possible. And if you go to that website that Chad mentioned, humanesociety.org slash soaring, um, it's already filled out. All you have to do is enter your name and address, and it'll send a message to USDA. So, Keith, I want to make sure that listeners understand this. I mean, we're not asking to change anything with horse racing. We're not, you know, this is simply saying it's two things this rule would do, right? It would get rid of really cruel devices that are being used to soar horses, and it would have an independent group of inspectors under the USDA that are not connected to the industry. These are veterinarians. And so those are the two things this rule does, correct? 
the, the big primary things that it does that will end soaring. Yes, there are a few other small things, but those are the key things that we really want to see happen. And that would dramatically change things for the horses and... That's right. USDA is still going to have to enforce their own regulations and the law and weed out those who are continuing to violate. But without those devices and without those conflicted industry inspectors, soaring will eventually go away. And we'll be now, monitoring to make sure that it does. Great. And I want to make sure that I know uh, listeners, especially those that maybe aren't policy wonks, it's easy to think, what? Federal rule? Regulatory? Agency? This is too much. I don't know what's going on, but you mentioned the website. If they go there, it will walk them through what to do. Um, you know, making public comment to on federal regulation is actually quite easy. And there's what what are we talking here, Keith? Three minutes tops, maybe? Yeah, if that. You know, the last time we asked our supporters to take action on a measure similar to this, having to do with the horse soaring issue, we got almost a hundred thousand public comments, which is huge. We want to at least get that many or more. So, you know, uh, it would be great if uh, listeners not only took action, but shared that page with all of their friends on social media and everything else and uh, tried to expand the base of support even wider. Absolutely. So, Keith, so I think everybody will go to humanesociety.org slash soaring to raise their hand to get in involved on this issue. S-O-R-I-N-G. That's soaring. right. <laughs> uh, Keith. You mentioned this a bit ago, but how long has our organization been working on this and how long have you been working on this? Well, I came to the animal protection movement because of this issue. I grew up with Tennessee walking horses, so I've been working on it for most of my adult life. I admit to at least 25 or 30 years. Let's wow. Think of that. That's amazing. And, um, you know, and HSUS has been working on it very actively for the last 20 years, so it's a uh, it's an issue you know we've seen a lot of people come and go through this movement on this issue um because it's very um it's been a tough one to address and to challenge and to take on like i said we've made great progress through our uh, undercover investigations through our exposés through our you know public awareness campaign um but we want to end this once and for all and we can and we will and we're not going to give up until we do well and i love the idea that you know you said we've made progress on this um, and, you know, we talk often on this podcast about all the different things HSUS does and all of the amazing folks that we talk to. Um, and so we work on a lot of issues, but this is a great example of taking an issue and doggedly, pun intended, you know, working it for years and years and years. And it speaks to the tenacity of the work, but also your singular vision in this, Keith. You know, this is something at some point. And probably, you know, if listeners, you mobilize with us, it can be checked off the list. I mean, there's so many fights we have that seem like, oh, it's five years, it's 10 years, it's 20. This is within reach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to get there. And, you know, this is a, a unique issue, at least in the horse world, in that we've got such a broad coalition of support out there. The veterinary community, AVMA, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the American Horse Council, and all of its breed and discipline uh, members, you know, multiple different breed organizations, law enforcement. There's just such a broad base of support, which we don't often find on all of our issues, whether it be equine or other. Um, literally, the only people opposed to this effort to end story are the ones that are doing it. Wow. Well said. Keith, thank you so much. I'll give it to you one more time. Last chance, everybody. HumaneSociety.org slash soaring. So get there. It's super easy. Just name an address and you'll raise your hand and try to help us help these horses. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Keith, for being here. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. We will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.